I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes on March 1st, 1966. Uh, I was not in diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, yet I spent approximately 10 days in a hospital ward. Um, that was the era. Uh, in that time, uh, you had to stay in the hospital to learn how to control your diabetes. And so whatever education I or my family received came in the form of a book, which I could not really fathom or, or understand, uh, plus practicing giving injections uh, into uh, a piece of fruit. Uh, now, fortunately, I didn't do what I've heard other stories of patients doing, is giving the insulin into the fruit, then eating the fruit, thinking that's how they took the insulin. <laughs> I did not make that, that, that mistake. Uh, but um, that was my introduction to diabetes. One injection per day was the, the, the style back then which I was on for approximately 15 years until the early 1980s when I uh, enrolled in medical school and encountered a wonderful endocrinologist by the name of Dr. Melvin Prince and Dr. Prince set me on the path to uh, controlling my diabetes much better. Now I, my first hemoglobin A1C at that time was 10.8 percent. I do remember that value. Um, at that time he was trying to convince me to take more than one insulin injection per day. What I was taking was a very long-acting insulin called uh, 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 Lente, L-E-N-T-E. Um, I was very resistant to this and I used that, that uh, behavior as a, a point of reference when I'm working with patients now. I used every rationale I could conjure up to say I'd done fine for 15 years with one injection. Why do I need to change? And so it wasn't until uh, after the patients of several excellent diabetes educators, which I uh, worked with, that convinced me that I should try something different. And after about four months, I decided to go to two injections per day. Immediately, I started feeling better. Um, I saw an immediate benefit to that beyond whatever I, the A1C was representing. And in fact, in that day, I didn't even know what an A1C was. Um, and so after I went to two injections, within a year or so, I was doing three. And then uh, after that, uh, very quickly, I was on an insulin pump. And then for the next 30 years or more, uh, I was on and off an insulin pump a good part of that time. Um, and through all this, my A1C continued to fall. Uh, my control uh, obviously improved. My attitudes changed about diabetes. Uh, I was less in the dark than I was for the first 15 years. But all throughout the decade of the 70s and the latter half of the 60s, I was on one injection per day with strictly doing urine testing. Uh, very little knowledge about diabetes. My first episode of diabetic ketoacidosis occurred when I went to college, and, and I forgot to take one injection for in, of insulin. And in the day, you could not purchase insulin on a weekend at a pharmacy. Uh, and so I thought I could go one extra day without doing that, because my parents had been so good at giving me my single injection. Well, I found out very quickly that was not going to work. And uh, I spent three days in the hospital infirmary uh, in diabetic ketoacidosis. And that was the last time that ever happened because I do learn lessons fairly quickly. Um, and so my diabetes control has evolved over the years and I eventually became uh, an endocrinologist. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist uh, and I serve children with this condition and adults. And I have practiced adult medicine as well. Uh, but um, I have a passion, just like everyone in this room does, for type 1 diabetes, and I'm looking forward to sharing that information in, in the new book, Sugar Surfing. I, I know many people now who are good friends of mine who, uh, through their diabetes or having a close family member with the condition, it's moved them into that field or, or into work related to that field in some fashion. In fact, my co-author, Kevin McMahon, uh, his passion for this uh, uh, stems from his daughter, uh, Darby, who was diagnosed with this as a toddler, and he wanted to develop a technology to help uh, share the information from her blood sugar meter uh, to the parents in real time. And we uh, connected in 2002, and we developed this device called the Glucomon. In fact, Kevin did most of the developing. I helped uh, the medical side of it. And that led to millions of dollars of grants and uh, uh, research papers and so on, which culminated in a paper we did in 2012 in Diabetes Care, uh, which was based on the concept of what we call frequent pattern management, which was the forerunner of what I today call sugar surfing. Eighty-one, eighty-two uh, was when I got my first insulin pump, uh, and it was a bulky contraption. It was called an MP6, uh, made by the Auto Syringe Company. Uh, it was the size of two, two and a half decks of cards. Uh, you had to replace the battery daily. You could not disconnect the pump from your body because there was no disconnect mechanism at that point in time, and the electronics were very primitive compared to today's technologies. 
when I was at diabetes camp, and I've been working at camps now for 34 years, um, one year, one of the pumps I was wearing uh, went into runaway mode, which basically gave me over 50 units of insulin in a very short period of time. Had I not been rooming with an, an, an endocrinology fellow at the time, I probably wouldn't be here today. Uh, he was very instrumental in rescuing me from a very severe case of hypoglycemia that occurred during the middle of the night. And when we look back at the pump uh, uh, record, it showed that it had given me 53 and a half units. Now, there were no safety mechanisms built into insulin pumps at that time. So I've been through a large succession of different insulin pumps over the uh, decades and uh, been involved with the, the actually development of some of them. Uh, I've gotten to know some of the people in some of the companies, giving them physician suggestions and so on. Uh, for improvement, uh, but they're, they're very safe devices now, no question about that. But I, I still have one basic rule of insulin pumping I use with all my, my patients, and that is a pump is no better or worse than a human being that it's attached to. And I mean that in the sense that they're understanding and they're training on how to use it properly. Absolutely, absolutely. In the diabetes education world, and I'm in, in, in a friendly audience here, uh, we are trained to educate people with what we call survival skills. And survival skills do include how to treat uh, low blood sugar with glucagon injections, uh, how to treat low blood sugar with the simple foods and fast-acting carbohydrates, how to withdraw and administer, if you have to do that with a vial and syringe, an insulin dose or use a pen uh, these days. Um, the basics of what we call meal planning, um, they call it medical nutrition therapy where I come from. Uh, we also call it carbohydrate counting as well. Um, there is a challenge, in uh, whether it's in the UK or in the United States, for getting the proper education for diabetes. I would dare say that's a worldwide problem as well. Um, and when do you teach these things? Well, we, we focus on survival skills in my practice, and those are actually stretched out over several weeks because when you put a stopwatch to it and look at the time you spend with a patient, uh, a, new, a newly diagnosed patient with type 1 diabetes, first of all, they're often in a crisis situation. They're coming off of being admitted to an intensive care unit for diabetic ketoacidosis, possibly, or just the shock of being told that they or their loved one has type 1 diabetes. Um, they're not necessarily in the best uh, state of mind to learn. Uh, as opposed to the type 2 population, which oftentimes take about a month or so to settle into the diagnosis before they need to be taught how to manage it. But they have the luxury of time on their side because they're not in an, in an acute metabolic condition like somebody with type 1 is when they're diagnosed, who have to learn insulin from the very beginning. So we have to teach these survival skills to the, to the, to the um, uh, type 1s as they are, are diagnosed. But I look at it this way. Uh, it's a 12 to 14 hour process if you do it from start to finish. Trying to teach anybody uh, all that information in 12 to 14 hours all in one setting uh, is daunting, and, if not impossible, and, and actually very inefficient. So we have found that stretching that out over several days or weeks is the best way to do it. Having patients come back uh, after they've been sent home from hospital back to the, to the clinic setting. Now that may work well for certain people uh, who live close to the, to the facility, but for others who may have to travel, that becomes an issue. Uh, we are now starting telemedicine. Uh, I'm not sure how prevalent telemedicine or telehealth is uh, here in the UK, but we, I've been doing that for 10 years uh, in my practice, and we're just re-implementing it in my new practice now, uh, where we can follow up people uh, via uh, uh, you know, electronic links on their, on their computers. There, there, are, there are literally dozens, if not hundreds, of camps uh, in the United States that serve children with type 1 diabetes. Um, my experience has been a 34-year experience with camps uh, that started out of an innocent comment that was made to me uh, while I was having blood drawn uh, at a research, uh, as a research subject, uh, saying, would you mind coming to our camp to volunteer? And I said, sure, why not? And now, 34 years later, I'm the medical director of this camp. I've been doing that for a quarter century, uh, encountering thousands of, of young men and women uh, uh, that volunteer at camp uh, um, and, and campers age six and older, now it's, all, now it's eight to 15 is the age range. Um, and in fact, my daughter, that's the reason I'm in, in country right now is because my daughter married one of the camp counselors uh, from Orkney and we're going up there to visit. Uh, that's why this visit occurred in the first place. 
the camps are a, a phenomenal place for children with diabetes to feel a part of something. Uh, in fact, they'll say that. They, they, they feel like they're accepted, nobody's judging them, um, and, and they're just all normal children, normal kids. And when I go to camp, I have such a reaffirming uh, feeling uh, about life uh, with diabetes when I see these hundreds of boys and girls enjoying themselves, having the time of their lives uh, for each for a week, uh, and not thinking about their diabetes not having to think about their diabetes, thinking about, thinking about their friends and their relationships, who's going to ask whom out to the dance on, on Thursday <laughs> night. That's the core issue of the day, not what their blood sugar is. Yeah. That, to me, is probably the most affirming point of camp. Point of camp uh, uh, At the dance, it's, it's, it's a fascinating thing. I take pictures of the camp every year and, and post them online. When I'm standing over the, over the dance floor watching all these boys and girls having fun, talking, chatting, uh, I have this, this transcendent moment about how all these kids are having this, you know, they're not thinking about diabetes. The farthest thing in their minds is diabetes, and, and they're just loving life. And that makes me want to come back every year. And the staff that I've been fortunate enough to work with over the years, a woman by the name of Patsy Reyes, uh, Peter Kwan, who have donated decades of their lives to come help operate and, and support this camp. And uh, there are other camps like mine out there. Uh, they all serve a, a noble purpose, in my opinion, and children benefit from it. I, I went to camp as a child as well. I think everyone that has a child with diabetes should consider consider sending their child to a camp if it fits their lifestyle. Uh, if you happen to have experience with diabetes yourself, especially type 1, you might consider donating some of your time uh, to attend a camp and, and share that experience with them because we're all in this together is how I look at this. None of us are any better or any worse than anybody else. We all have come, we, have, we all have experiences we can share with people and camps provide an ideal opportunity to share those, those experiences. Well, I think if you're contemplating uh, attending a camp or volunteering as a camp, uh, uh, remember, you have a tremendous amount of experience about your, either your own diabetes, if it, you're the one with the diabetes, or your son's or daughter's diabetes. Um, come with an open mind. Uh, there are different ways of doing things, and what you'll learn are different styles and different approaches. You may actually learn more in some ways than what you teach in some ways, too. That's how I look at it. Um, I'll be the first person to tell people that come in to see me that I don't know everything there is to know about diabetes. Uh, I may have had it for 50 years, I may have worked in it for 35 years, but I, I, the more I learn, the less I feel that I know. And I, but I feel that's an empowering attitude because it makes me want to learn more. I, I try to check my ego and my title at the front gates of the camp. I'm just as much of a human being as anybody that comes into that camp, and that's how I comport myself with people. And uh, it makes me feel better about myself because I, there's no you know, class differential between me and my patients. Yes, I have to do the same things they do. I have to walk the same walks, talk the same talks as they do. Uh, and it's, uh, I know how hard it is. I know what a challenge it is. Um, I also tell people this, uh, that get to know me fairly well, and that is 50 years ago, 50 years ago, in the natural world order, I, I should have died. Okay? Anybody with type 1 diabetes, without insulin, exogenous outside insulin, we should die. Uh, so my attitude about that is every day is special that I'm still here. And I've been fortunate enough to, to string 50 years of days together, and hopefully 50 more. But um, it's hard to, to maintain a negative outlook towards life when you look at life that way. Uh, that it's a gift, and, and we have a, a chronic illness. Uh, but there are lots of other people in this world that have chronic illnesses, which I would consider far more serious and dire than mine, um, yet I've been fortunate enough, blessed, whatever word you'd like to use, to still be here. So what is my obligation? It's to share what I know, and whether it's in my medical practice, uh, through what I can write in a book or on a, uh, on a post, uh, that's how I look at it. So, uh, and I'm always learning from my patients. Uh, I'm always learning from what people post uh, that their experiences are, but that's what diabetes is all about, is sharing, in my opinion, sharing what we know and supporting other people.